Hello, I hope you're all doing well. Today I am finally getting around to talking about the books that I read in August. First up, I read what I think is my first non-fiction book for this year, and that was High Sobriety by Jill Stark. Jill Stark is an Australian journalist from Melbourne, though she was originally born in Scotland, and she started writing this because she was the health reporter for one of the newspapers in Melbourne, and so was of course writing a lot about binge drinking and the drinking culture in Australia, because that is a massive health issue obviously. And this was in direct contrast to her own drinking habits. She never considered herself a problematic drinker, but having a big night out of a weekend was definitely a regular part of her routine. So the book starts off on New Year's Day after a massive New Year's Eve party. I think Jill is around 35 at this point and she's sort of realizing that the hangovers are not very easy to get over anymore. And so she decides to give up drinking for, I think it's three months at first. And the effects of not drinking, even for that short amount of time, are so astonishing. She decides she's going to continue the experiment for a whole year. I heard Erica from Erica Reads talking about this book and it sounded so fascinating to me as someone who does not particularly drink. The reason I don't drink very much is because I just don't like the taste and it always makes me feel kind of sick. I never seem to get those like happy buzzy feelings that other people seem to get from alcohol. I don't know why, there must be something wrong with my brain I guess. And I have definitely felt the wrath of people when I'm in a situation where you're supposed to have a drink and I say no I don't want one. I always say that it's kind of funny that people seem to get more offended by the fact that I don't drink than the fact that I'm vegan and you know how much people hate vegans. So anyway, as a non-drinker it was fascinating to see the other side of the story. This was really interesting to see the perspective of someone who loves drinking, who doesn't really want to give it up, but was able to recognize that their drinking was actually having a negative effect on their life. Jill in the book is really open and honest about her feelings and her experiences. She talks about all the positive things that have come out of not drinking, such as just feeling more alert and awake in the day, having more energy, and generally having more time to get stuff done because she's not recovering from a hangover every weekend. But she also talks a lot about how it makes her feel really left out, how rude people are. There was one man who said, oh, I can't wait until you finish this experiment so that you're fun again, which is just the most horrible thing to say to someone. The part that I found really fascinating was when she decided that she would continue to go out and participate in drinking events and just wouldn't drink herself and how she found that she could have just as much fun if not more fun sober at a concert or in a club because she herself loves dancing she still enjoyed the music and she still had a great time and in some ways she found she had a better time because she was more easily able to ward off not particularly nice people who might try to approach her in these situations but the thing I found most telling was that the times when she really wanted to drink were in the more casual situations, especially when she was just having a drink with a friend or two, not because she wanted one necessarily, but because it made them uncomfortable to be drinking and she wasn't. It was such a perfect example of how in society we do things that aren't necessarily good for us, but if we do them as a group, it's seen as we're giving each other permission to do these things. So I'd highly recommend this book, whether you don't like drinking, whether you do like drinking. I think it's a conversation that Australia as a country and the world in general needs to have about alcohol because I think problems with alcohol are always put under a banner of addiction or people who are having a hard time in their lives. Those are the only people with problems with alcohol. I think it's very easy for people to kid themselves into thinking they don't have a problem because they're just doing what everyone else does. And this book really talks about how we are all complicit in the problems with alcohol because we make that excessive amount of drinking acceptable. Next I read my second non-fiction book for the year which is a Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. This is the first Virginia Woolf book that I have finished. I tried to read Mrs. Dalloway ages ago and just couldn't get into it at all, but I really would like to get into her fiction novels, so if anyone has a recommendation for what should be my first fiction Virginia Woolf, let me know below. This has to be the most famous feminist essay written in the English language, and because I'm reading it now, all the arguments that Virginia Woolf makes in the essay I've obviously read before somewhere else, but it is always fascinating to go to the origin of ideas. It took me a little while to get into it because she kind of makes her arguments in a roundabout sort of way. The structure of the essay is written around the story of her writing the essay itself, but the points that she is making are still so scarily relevant today and are still things that need to be widely talked about and discussed. As the title suggests, Wolf is making the argument that the reason women are not as prominent in the arts or in 
literature as men are in history is because they did not have a room of their own. She's basically saying it's nothing to do with this idea that people had at the time of women's brains not being suited to the creation of fine literature, but simply to do with the patriarchy and the fact that women rarely had any autonomy, they had no control over their finances, and they had very specific roles that they were boxed into, whether that be in the type of work they had to do or simply just having to be a mother and looking after children. And that was why when women did begin to write, only the richest or at least middle class women were able to afford the luxury of having time to write. And she kind of makes the point that um, even Jane Austen did not have a room of her own. And imagine how many more brilliant works she could have written if she had had a simple study. Virginia Woolf talks about the fact that she herself is only able to write because she was fortunate enough to have an annual inheritance. There is still a certain privilege in being able to create works of fiction. To have the time to write a novel, you have to have a source of income that allows you that time and that luxury. The last book I read in August was The Pumpkin Eater by Penelope Mortimer. This is a book published in 1962 and is a sort of semi-autobiographical novel where a nameless protagonist is narrating basically her descent into depression. She's had several husbands and several children. In fact, the number of children is never named. It's just sort of this ambiguous horde of children that live with her and her current fourth husband, and she's somewhat addicted to having children. This story kind of details different aspects of her life as a teenager living with her parents, and then in the current situation, what it is like to live with a famous screenplay writer, and how once he starts making a lot of money from his writing and they move to a big house and are able to afford servants and nannies, she begins to lose a lot of her purpose. The book really is about the contrast between the way women are expected to behave and how the protagonist feels inside, and it's about how at that time women were meant to rely on men for everything, whether that's their father or their husband or their doctor, and how all the men in this woman's life do not have her best interests at heart, so she just simply can't rely on them to make the best decisions for her. And that lack of trust is really what sends her into a spiral. It's a very short novel, and I wasn't sure if I was enjoying it when I was reading it, but towards the end I just found myself quite compelled and quite fascinated by the writing and by the character. You sort of really get drawn into her narrative voice and start to feel like you're really her confidant or even her therapist and there is a therapist in the story who's really not very good at his job so you kind of feel like you as a reader are a stand-in for this therapist in a way. So that's what I read in August, thank you for watching and I will see you next time, bye!